I was born in Missouri and I moved with Salem, Missouri, down in the Ozarks, and we moved to East Tennessee and Greenville, Tennessee. I spent, let's see, 1968 until college in 81. Then I went to college out in Missouri again at Westminster College. Then after college, I ended up moving here in Bryson, North Carolina. So I've been here since um, 19. No, I moved here in 87 after walking the Appalachian Trail. Right. And we'd already established that you're 60. So you've been around for a bit. Yeah. Um, I, I did not anticipate that because obviously I looked you up before we sat down. And um, I, I, at, looking back now, actually, it makes sense because your timeline is quite impressive. Uh, your resume is impressive. So it would make sense that you're 60, but you look a lot younger. So kudos. You're doing, you're doing well, great. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, hopefully it stays up. It stays that way for a while. Right. <laughs> All right. Talk talk to me about fishing. How did that enter the mix in your life? My grandfather started uh, started to take me down. He had a place outside of Cotter in Arkansas when I was a kid, and it was he was a surgeon. So he had a house down there to get away from it all when I was little, and would go down there and stay at the White River. And then he had a place near Montauk, which is now a state park in Missouri, it's a blue ribbon stream off the current river. So that's the two places I went a lot as a kid. And, um, that's kind of what got me started in it really was, was through him. Did you have to fish and, out of the white in a boat back then? Uh, no, we did. We used boats, but a lot of times it, you get lower levels just like today. And you could wade in certain places and fish riffles and things on low water. And, uh, yeah, we did that a lot as, I went back down there a lot when I was in college. I just, cause that's kind of where I started and cut my teeth. So I'd spent a lot of time down there in college too. It was several, it was maybe three hours to drive down there, but it was worth the three hours, you know, to be there. Yeah. Yeah. So I like that part of the country a lot and I miss it. I mean, I live in an area that has a lot of uh, free stones and tailwaters, but still the whites kind of special to me, not just cause the, big fish and world records and all that just from being special because it's kind of isolated it's rural and I, I just like that part of the ozarks yeah it's pretty special we were there <clears throat> excuse me we were there in january and i did not know that there's catfishing we were not catfishing but someone had told me that they fish for cats is that right yeah down further i'm sure they do because we did a trip with the kids last three years ago when COVID hit we did the buffalo river from the headwaters where the canoes you know stand up boards and canoes can barely make it over and I took a drift boat a five-seater drift boat from the headwaters all the way down to the white and there was all kinds of uh yeah there's catfish there was alligator gar lots of different brim and it was great because my, my nieces live in Colorado my wife's a twin so her little girls they were the same age as my boys so everybody that you know that fished that was just like throw it in and they get a nibble right away there's so much warm water I think I think that was one of Whitlock's favorite places down there, really, from what Davies told me, is he loved the buffalo. But I love the buffalo, too, just because you don't know what you're going to get. You know, it's, it's kind of fun taking kids on something like that. Yeah, no doubt. All right. So then what about your fishing career? Where did that start to enter your life? Oh, uh, I would say as a kid, really. Um, when I was young, I can remember most of the I did a casting book. Most of that I compiled when I was around 15 to 16 years old. And I didn't publish it because I didn't have Adobe and all that. We didn't even have computers when I was in college. So that tells you how old I am. There weren't any computers in college. Nowadays, everybody has a computer. But when I taught a fly fishing program at Western Carolina University, I, I taught a program for fly fishing and entomology there at the university. And I had an exchange student that was from France. And so I basically took the whole manuscript as a kid and had him type it in to a word document. So then I could lay it out in um, page maker. Okay. And that's how we compiled it. And so it was kind of neat. I didn't really change any of the descriptions though, of the, a lot of casting, like with curves and piles and just, you know, the difference of aerial men's and versus a uh, casting stroke. So it was just a lot of that detail and I didn't really think I'd do it in college though either. So I don't know. It's kind of an odd, you know what I mean? I didn't really foresee that in college. I just knew I liked it a lot in college. And then I guess what made my mind up April, like I said, I walked to, to Maine after college 
because everybody was getting real jobs and getting married and all these things. And I thought, well, I don't really know what I want to do. So I'll, I'll walk for three months. So I walked to Maine and the whole time that I hiked right through here, the AT is right above the house here. That's where we went yesterday with my youngest kid. That's the Appalachian my wife Trail. And I. Yeah. So, we, so that's when I kind of decided walking to Maine that, yeah, this is what I'm going to do is work an outdoor wreck. And so I never have had a real job. So it's kind of funny. Like every time I meet somebody with a real job, I'm just like, yeah, it's kind of fun. It's <laughs> been like, like a fairy tale. <laughs> yeah. I don't really have one. So I wouldn't know. Um, okay. We've got to backtrack a bit. So the credentials to be able to, uh, to teach a program at the college or the university, what were your credentials at the time? I majored in econ and accounting in college. And, and I guess that just because I started the, uh, we have a program here called delayed harvest that was copied out of Pennsylvania. Okay. And I took that to the state back in 91 and they implemented the first one on the upper Nantahala, then the second one at the university where I taught. Now there's 37 of them. And so part of it was from that. I already ran an outfitting. That was the first outfitter. There wasn't any guides in this part of the country back then in the mid eighties. So, so it was kind of funny. Like when I started doing it, then people realized somebody could make a living doing it here. It's a huge whitewater area here with the outdoor center. There's a Nantahala outdoor center, which has like 60 Olympic world and national champions in whitewater. So that was the people I was teaching with a lot on the river. We're all whitewater people. And they started a program at NOC and I ran the fly fishing program down there. And then they had a change in management and they said, no, we, we want to specialize just in whitewater, no fly fishing, no rock climbing, no other outdoor wreck activities. So when they did that, that's when I made the split from working there and did the fly fishing full time. So okay, yeah, so I guess that was it. Starting your guiding company, what was that like and what prompted that? Well, just because the demand, I mean, there was demand for it. We knew that from the newsletters that NOC would send out, like we'd run a spring and fall clinic. And every time they did the newsletters, as soon as the people got them, the clinics were full within a day. So that told me there was demand for it, but but it just wasn't a popular thing in this part of the country. So, I mean, I guess part of it too, for like teaching at the college, I'd already written a lot of articles for for different European magazines and American magazines. And so I was already... I had, I had that going for me, but I, other than that, I didn't have a whole lot going for me, I guess, other than the articles that were out there, you know, and starting the DH. So it kind of took a while to get, to get momentum with that. I think that took the hardest part because this comes up a lot during the, during the guide schools, people ask like, where do I start? And that's a tough question because for everybody, I think it's a little bit different. You know, I was real lucky. One of the guys that was from Bryson City named Jim Cassida. He was the president of the Outdoor Riding Association for North America. And I took him out a few times and he really blessed me with a, a lot of good articles that he wrote about the experience. And all of a sudden, I mean, the phone started ringing quite a bit from, from his writing. And I think that's what really helped because I think if that wouldn't have happened, I don't know, we probably would have been in poverty going into every winter, you know, so... So that really helped. And then, of course, the movie came out. And what was that, 91? Mm -hmm. I think the river runs through it. When that oh, came out, that was so... a huge shot of adrenaline. Yeah, I was going to ask what happened when it came out because you were doing this before then, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. And it, yeah. it definitely brought a lot of demand. We actually just watched the new one last night with uh, Ending the Line. Have you heard that? Heard about it? Yep, yep. It was, it was good. Like, we watched that the whole family last night. And I don't, I don't know. I thought it, it was a really good. It was good. I don't know if it'll do the same thing as Norman McLean's movie, but it, it'll probably help some. So how did you notice that your business boomed? I mean, I'm just assuming the sheer amount of phone calls, there were no emails at the time. Yeah. Just the, I mean, you'd get calls from housewives and they'd say, we just saw the movie and that meant you were taking them. You know what I mean? There was a lot of that. It wasn't even like the husband's and things that were booking it at that time, a lot of times it'd be the kid or the, or the wife that would call and book it because they saw the movie. Oh, so this is a big outdoor area because I live right next to like the National Park. The Great Smoky Mountains is a quarter mile from the house. So we already get 14 million people a year through here. So it's a huge mecca for people on vacation, you know? Right. So it helps with that. Like then that movie comes out and then 
course, that wasn't a bad thing at all. But yeah, that was then. <laughs> Things were different at 22, 25, 35, you know, where I'm at now. So, I mean, I'm still doing a lot of outfitting, but yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty, you know, back then you're happy just to get some, to get a day, you know, and yeah. it's way different when you get older. Like I talked to Davey a lot. I saw you down there eating on one of your posts you made, but Davey's a good friend of mine. We talk about how things are different now at this age versus, you know, 30, 40 years ago. It's very different. So we're a little bit more discerning, I think, with what we do time-wise, yeah. you know, because I got a lot of people that work trips for me too. So, I mean, I can kind of pick and choose. Yep, that's a Disneyland trip, an entertainment trip is what I call it, versus an educational trip. I only do the educational trips because I'm not into the entertainment trips at 60. Yeah. I know it I, sounds funny, but that's just where I'm at. No, nope, I actually think it sounds about right. Uh, let's yeah. go. I, I'm still back at, at in your late teens, early 20s. What were you guiding for? Okay. Was, was, it, tr was it trout primarily? Trout. Okay. Yeah, mostly trout. Yeah. And now the book that you had compiled when you were 15 or 16. Was this with the help of the FFF? Was this just something that you were coming up with? Did you have a mentor? How did that all come to be? And what happened with the book? Yeah, it was just, it was really from a, from solving problems, which even this age, I mean, we talk a lot during the schools. What is fly fishing? Fly fishing is just one huge um, complex problem, really, when you get down to it. And it's like, especially casting, like in this part of the country, we have a lot of, uh, we have the highest number of deciduous trees in the world here. So it's like casting in a cave. So we do a lot of single-handed spay. A lot of that book was single-handed spay back when I was a little kid, before I even knew that was such a thing. I mean, I knew there were spay rods at 15, but even spay casting has really jumped huge from back when I was that age. There's a lot of new, and I think a lot of really cool things that are going on even in, in the spay world. And it's, and I've seen this happen all my life with like different um, regions that people are very abrasive to not look at change in a positive way. And there's a guy in Germany I see, I'm sure you've seen that, the, the guy that's posting always the bonker space stuff of catching the line around his rod, you know, 15 foot rod. I just think that all that stuff is very creative and very genius. And then you'll see people criticize it because it's not traditional. Well, I do it a lot with the single rod. I mean, I just think that it's another feather to put in your, you know, in your quiver. And I think all those things are, are worth embracing with, rather than, there's a lot of people reluctant to just talk about tradition. And of course, you know how that works. If they keep talking about just tradition, then we're not moving any evolution. So I'm not really into getting stagnant at this age either. So when that new stuff comes out, I just think that that's what mostly the book was, is talking about curves in piles. This is back at the time when, uh, Swisher and Richard's book had just come out, which started to address modules with like adding a reach man to a curve cast, things like that. So we can do this, this, and this. And then all of a sudden it's kind of like bacon brownies and say, you got these ingredients. What can we mix with these other modules? And so that's what I find still intriguing to teach on the road, like advanced line control classes. That's kind of what I enjoy the most. Uh, so you, you're a master caster. I just want to lay that out there right now, because that's, something that needs to be acknowledged. It's a big deal. When did you get that? I got that back in, uh, let's see, early 2000s is when I did that. And that's when I met Carl from New Zealand. That's when I met a lot of those folks that were over here from New Zealand when they were, I think they did it that same year out in Livingston and Paul Arden from England. There was a bunch of good folks. That's back when the conclaves were actually a lot of fun. Like you'd show up and there'd be all kinds of casting geeks from all over the world. Yeah. And then they got smaller and smaller. I think the last one I went to in Livingston was probably in 2015, maybe 16. But yeah, the numbers, the, the, the people, the young people weren't coming like they did you know, earlier. I miss those times. I wish we had a casting geek gathering somewhere in the world. But I think those days are maybe gone, you know, from YouTube and all the, I don't know, hopefully they'll come back, but I think it's yeah. more on YouTube and stuff now. There's some really fun young spay conclaves, which is interesting. I I just yeah. have kind of put two and two together now, but yeah, you're right. A lot of the the tradition, the you know, the regular, the historical conclaves have gotten older, but the spay ones are still quite young. I, w I wonder why. I don't know. Like Sandy Clave, you mean like the ones up in Northwest? Yeah, yeah and Brian Niska used to do a, a cast and blast. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've been out there to Salem and some of the ones that were around like in Oregon, they, they were a lot of fun. They had a lot of um, real creative, real creative activities and festivities the whole weekend, you know, it was good fun, but yeah, I don't know. We're, they're trying to resurrect a lot of this with conclaves. I know in the States and I was actually on a zoom call with FF, FFI, the new leadership roles right before we started this. And that's what a lot of the consensus is, how we get back to that. Another problem is just from doing a lot of shows, like I've been on the road since the 1st of January, which is pretty typical since like 93 with shows. And I'll tell you this, like the, the clubs, I mean, I really see that as being a, a big blockade. It's so many of these clubs that we talk to, like the oldest clubs in North America, they don't, they're not, I think they need to open a lot of them up, you know, and have their wives come, but they don't do that. And then you get a lot of these clubs where the, you know, the youngest people there are working on their 40th prostate exam. And that's not a good sign for where the state of affairs is heading, you know? Cause I mean, I'm, I'm young. I mean, at 60, I'm like way younger than who I'm talking to. And so I think that needs to hopefully change down the road, like make it a family affair, bring the wife and kids and everybody, you know? But so many of them, like up in the Northeast and even in some of them in the Southeast that I see are just, I think they're going to fade away in the next five, 10 years because they're not opening up. And that's, I don't understand. Maybe you didn't ask me my opinion, but I'm just saying that unless they open up, I think they'll be a thing of the past. Yeah, I see it happening. I see it happening in Canada, America, and Australia. So it's definitely an international uh, situation. Yeah. Yeah. Let's it's, fix uh, that, April. How are we going to fix it? It, they just have, it has to be more fun. They've got to break away from the everybody gets together and talk minutes and then there's a presentation and everybody schmoozes and talks about how great their fishing was. And yeah, it's the same thing every time, everywhere I go. And don't get me wrong. I, I love the members and, how, and I usually have a pretty good time, but it's just yeah. so boring. I can't believe I just said that because once upon a time, part of my livelihood was getting paid to go and do this, but it's just so boring. Yeah, yeah. No, I hear you. I, I can say, <laughs> yeah, and that's what this whole winter has been made up of that on the weekend, you know, because some of the shows were fun. I mean, a lot of the shows that, that are, Denver's the new really big show in the world, I think. Denver had like five or 6,000 people a day again this year. Denver for the last four years has kind of taken that new spot. Not, what I love about that show is just the dedication of how many people jump in the car and drive 14, 15 hours. It's because it's a Western thing. In the East, they would never do that. Like, I mean, like Atlanta, the Atlanta show has a good turnout, but I'm saying they don't drive more than an hour and a half away to come to Atlanta show. You see what I mean? And at West, they're coming from like down near Mexico and coming down from Canada and coming all over the West. So it's like people are willing to drive and it shows you that they're more passionate about driving a long ways to be there and be a part of it. So it's just a different vibe, I guess you'd say. Well, and there's the anticipation of getting there. You know, you, you drive 14 hours, you're pretty excited by the time you get there. And, and I think that's the other thing going, circling back to the clubs, you know, it's very formal, which is wonderful in, in some situations, but I don't want to be formal. I want to go and have a good time. I don't want to be stuck yeah. in a chair. I want to have a couple of drinks and loosen up with some mates. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, that's, the, that's what would be, I think, helpful, you know, for the, those. The, the Denver show has that, you know, and the Denver region has got all the, the fun places to go and eat. And, you know, it's a, it's a small enough area downtown. Even when you're walking around, you bump into each other and it's got that vibe. Oh yeah. Well, I saw a lot of good folks from like Utah and Wyoming friends that have been out there working, you know, for years, it was just, and it kind of shocked me how far they just drove to check it out for the whole three days. And so that's always the fun part. Like you don't, you really never know who you're going to run into. Just, we don't get a lot of free time. So, I mean, the only free time you get at those really is like in the evening festivities. Cause like in the daytime, there's not there's not 20 minutes of free time to do anything, you know, for at least what I do. I mean, it's like, okay, go to give a seminar, come back, do a casting demo, go do a class. Then it's just like, you know what I'm saying? I wish that I wish sometimes we had more free time, like during the day. To go but, use uh, the bathroom or eat something. Yeah. <laughs> it would be Yeah, great. <laughs> it's what I mean. It's like it'd be nice to have a little more free time, but yeah, you just never know. Yeah. But um yeah. So how old are we now? 25. So I'd say what, so now what happens between let's do it in decades, 25 and 35. What did your career look like? 
And I was still real busy with, you know, doing shows. I started doing the Ferminsky shows back in 93. And so in the winter months, that would occupy some time because there wasn't a lot of guiding in the wintertime. Kind of like up in Canada, you know, when it gets all cold. Years ago, we used to get cold actually here. So I'm old enough to say, yeah, this, this whole climate thing's for real. There hadn't been a snowflake in the east until, what, two days ago it hit up in New York. But, I mean, it's just been mild every year and more and more mild. I played hockey as a kid in Missouri, and it's like we used to, like, play on ice skates on farm ponds all growing up in East Tennessee. They'd freeze two and three foot thick. I haven't seen a pond freeze in the southeast in 30 years. And I live right next to the biggest mountains in the East Coast. So it's like it's getting – it's definitely changed a lot with all this climate you know, climate stuff you hear, hear about. It's like the winters aren't as cold. We don't get to cross-country ski or get on lakes and ponds like we did as kids. So definitely the world's changing. It's not just here. I keep up with a lot of folks down there in New South Wales and Tassie and New Zealand. It's changing everywhere. So that's unfortunate. I wonder what our grandkids are going to get to experience. Yeah, I think about that yeah. often. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know what they'll get. I don't know what it'll be like because I'll be gone by then. But it's like it makes you wonder what it's going to turn to you know, down the road. So yeah, I don't know. But 25 to 35, that's a good question. Cause around 34, I had a lot of help that helped run the outfitting business. I got into adventure races. The first one I want to say was up there in BC, but anyway, it's those crazy races where you go without sleep for five, six days, you know, the Southern Traverse in New Zealand. I did that for about eight or nine years professionally. So that's what I do is stop. Sorry. Well, my bad. I apologize. Yeah. The first of all, go without sleep. Never heard of this. We're going to talk about that in a second. The Appalachian yeah. Trail, because I know that that sounded like a big pivotal part of your journey. Was that before this, during this, or after this? Oh, that's what I did right out of college. Two days right. after I graduated, I did and, that. And you did the walk to Maine, and it took three months. Yeah, a little over three months. Yeah. And how? What did that? What sort of impact did that have on you besides giving you good legs? Oh, it made me want to work in outdoor recreation. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. That's when I made the decision. Don't go get a, you know, avoid it like the plague. <laughs> right. I was thinking of going to law school. I, I was actually thinking of doing that, which I'm really glad I didn't. Thank God looking back. But it's like, that's was, I was thinking about all these what ifs, you know, to do at that age. I don't think most people know. And I keep telling my oldest boys about to go to college. I keep telling them the same thing, man, you got plenty of time to figure it out. You don't have to know. I feel like a lot of times everybody's expected to know when they're that young. And I'm like, you don't have to know what you want to study. Just be good at everything you're studying and figure out what you like, right. you know, but I think there's too much pressure on young kids like to think they're supposed to know I'm going to be an engineer or I'm going to be a fireman when they're 17, 16. Cause I've coached the U S youth kids a lot, even still. And it's like kids that age don't know. They just know they want to compete and be good at fishing. You know, and that's one thing that's cool. They got their focus and their passion in one thing not 30 directions. And so it's easy to coach kids that have that kind of motivation, but I don't think career life choices are, are decided at that young of an age personally. No, I don't think so either. You'll never hear us in this house say to our daughter, what do you want to be when you grow up? That Those words will never leave my mouth. Yeah, what, I think what, that's maybe good. What do you want to do? What do you want to be when you grow up? It's just too much pressure. It is. I mean, there's already enough other pressure with all this I mean, nowadays with social, we didn't have that either growing up, of course, but it's like, I just think that that puts extraneous pressure on young kids too. Yeah, it does. So, so, they, so th going back to this, no sleep, extreme sport, I don't understand. And I'm wondering if you might clarify what you mean by that. Well, there, there was New Zealand always had it with the Southern Traverse. They call it the Southern Traverse. It goes up over the Alps, Mount Cook, you know, you go from one side to the other, sometimes start up North. Uh, let's see. Up. I think the last one I did down there, Southern Traverse. Oh, what was the town? Mochueca? I think we started out of Mochueca. And um, it went down through Karamea Bend, ended up down in Queenstown. So you're paddling and you're tramping. Down there, they call it tramping. So you're tramping yeah. a lot at night. No, you know. AKA off, hiking. <laughs> yeah, off the off the trails, though. I mean, just bushwhacking through the woods, you know, and you get the, you know, the possums. They got a lot of those Australian possums in New they're Zealand. So soft. Yeah, and they'll get up in the trees and hiss at you, you know. But then you'll yeah. paddle too. A lot of times we'll paddle in sea kayaks or we'll use kayaks. So for me, 
the reason I took that up is I was teaching, you know, kayaking, canoeing a lot here at NOC. First bunch of years working with a lot of really talented instructors. So I thought it was the perfect thing. I, I was paid to run through college. I had a full scholarship running track. The only thing I was deficient in was riding a bike because I had to bike a lot to get better at that. But kayaking and running was already two real natural things to me. So when I saw there was a sport doing all three, I thought, hmm, because you know how there's lots of really good runners. You watch the people running like Boston, they're running like four minute miles. But if they stuck their tongue out, they'd look like a zipper, you know, they sure couldn't ride a bike or paddle a kayak being that skinny. You follow me? So there's a lot to be said in multi-sport because you could be good at all three, you know what I mean? And not be exceptional at any, that's what I liked about it. So the no sleep thing was good for me. All right. Too. I mean, just cause I learned that in college. I did a lot of, I, I was always the one that would put stuff off. I'd go to class, but when something big was coming up, I'd just stay up all night and do it the night before the exam and go take it. That's how I rolled all through college and it worked for me. A lot of people say, Oh, that's a horrible thing to do, but I didn't, I didn't know any other way than doing it that way. I was the same. Yeah. So I had to do it that way. Cause I mean, I'm like, okay, I better start studying. Cause this is a big final coming up, you know? So I did all right with sleep debt, like back then. And I, I did all right with it racing. I didn't have a whole, I mean, I had some places definitely of sleep deprivation of hallucinations and things after day three or four, but you learn to cope with it. You know what I mean? You can learn to, you got good teammates. You, there's four of you on a team. So you pass it off. Like usually my role was always navigation stuff with it too. So, I mean, I'd pass it off to somebody and I was lucky. I had a lot of good, really good navigators on the team. So whenever you're getting in that place, you just pass that off to somebody else. And, or and you, what was the purpose of this? Sorry to cut you off. It was this some always, sort of. Oh, there's big money in it, April. Back then there was big money sponsors gotcha. and big money, prize money, like the, Mild seven in China. That was up in the headwaters of the Yangtze River. We did that one five to five years. And they paid out like it was up in the millions of dollars, which no sport had that kind of money in it. The only reason I did it was the money because I lived in an area where it was like remote and rural. And I thought, you mean somebody's willing to pay us money if we do good? So then we started making money doing that. So I still had my outfit and stuff here rolling with Tony and folks keeping it all moving. But I didn't do any guiding. I didn't do any guiding when I was doing all the racing stuff in my mid thirties, you know, I'd still, I'd still do the shows in the winter and that kind of stuff, but I wasn't doing any there for a few years. I was on a hiatus of no outfit and trips for me. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Then, then what happens? I'm, I'm following through oh. I'm about early forties now or late thirties, early forties. Yeah. I got married. I was going to say you must have had I a family late. in there. Yeah, right. cause I was traveling all before, wasn't really doing, doing the commitment thing. So I had my kids when I was in my mid forties mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, that's when I started having kids quit. I quit going to Nepal and all these cool places and staying here, raising kids. So I've been here doing that now for, for a while. And now the oldest one's going to college this year. So couple more years and I get to go back doing the world thing, but I didn't want to get old. I learned, I learned that when I thought of the AT, I didn't want to get old and start wanting to go all these cool places as a decrepit old man that can't walk or do nothing, you know, cause I've worked those kind of people my whole life. And in a way I think it's sad. I shouldn't say that probably on this, but I've always thought it's sad. So they work and they make lots of money. Then they pull up and their health's failing them and it's the end of their rope. Cause they're going, I mean, they're literally so unhealthy. They're at the end of the rope and then they got to do their one or two trips somewhere cool. And that was their big blowout party, you know, for life. And I thought, no, nah, I'm going to do it the other way. I want to get all that traveling out of me to where I've got enough of those experiences as a young person and then have those memories as I get old. Then if I want to do another cool trip, at least still be able to do it for a while instead of, you know, the other way. Cause there's a way to do it cheap. Like I, I go on trips, I roll different than if we were running a trip taking a because i ran a lot of trips in new zealand with europeans back then and we'd do the fancy lodges the helicopter flyouts and all that but as soon as those people would fly back to europe i'd get helicoptered in and dropped off in caramia bend for three weeks just with a kayak and me and then i'd come down the river and be a river bum for three weeks exploring somewhere where nobody's fishing so i don't mind sleeping on a gravel bar and doing the trips like the way i like to do them 
but it's different. You can't do that commercially because then people are like, what's for dinner? They're, they they want to have it really pampered. You know what I'm saying? But I don't need that kind of, I still don't even, that's what we're doing for spring break. It's kind of funny. The kids want to go do another hike. And so they want to go to Georgia and walk back to here on the AT and that's 170 miles. So for spring break, they're like, daddy, let's go down there and we'll walk back. So my wife's all into it. So that's what we're going to do. I'm just like, great. So where do you, I've never done the trail or even seen it. Where do you sleep? Do you just tent out? Are there designated sleeping areas? Yeah. They, we're just going to, they, they have, there's some shelters, but we probably won't stay at the shelters. We'll just probably stay off the, I mean, there's a lot of overlooks. We'll stay somewhere up high on a ridge, most likely. Like that's where I like to sleep is up high where you can see out a long ways rather than be down in a, in a, I mean, cause you go up and down. I think it, I think that trip back to here is like 40, 44,000 feet of elevation. So it'll be, kids will be tired for the week of spring break. By the time we get back here, they're going to be tired, but they, they both run and the little ones a pole vault to the older ones running, he'll run in college. I mean, they'll be fine. I'm more worried about like, like Jennifer and my wife and myself will be the ones tired, you know, cause I haven't been doing any of that kind of walking. So it'll be fun. What's the hardest part about a trail like that? Just getting over the soreness the first few days, like the first four to five days. You from know what wa- I mean? Because I'm walking. Yeah. And then you get used to it. Your body gets in a rhythm after a couple of weeks of it. But <laughs> we're doing it the worst way because we're only doing it for five days. And then we'll be like good and crippled for a few weeks. And yeah. <laughs> but if we were to continue on, would you start getting used to it? You know, like your legs get used to it better. So, Did yeah, you... we're going to do the p- painful part. How many steps approximately every day do you do? Do you know? Mm, she knows because she wears that little step pedometer thing. Yeah, but I don't ever count steps like that. I mean, yeah, I, I just know this. Here's a bit of history. I used to, well, I shouldn't say this, but since it's for fly fishing, I will. But a thousand, you ever wonder, like this came up. So I used to think this is where the where the uh, distance for the AFMA fly line measurements at 30 feet. And well, I still think it has something to do because I teach with Gary a lot in the winter, Borger, and, and this came up and I said, I think it comes from the average Roman soldier being five feet because the mile in America comes from just Think about this arbitrary number. 5,280 feet is a thousand paces for the average Roman soldier. So 1,000 paces is 5,280 feet because I always wondered this back when I raced and, and taught navigating and stuff. So I thought, well, what a weird thing. Why would we pick a Roman soldier and who cares what he walks in a thousand paces? That's why we need to be like Canada and Australia and be on kilometers because it's ridiculous to think a thousand paces is some random number that we still adhere to. And we're the only country in the world that's not on metric. It's crazy. It's total craziness not to be on metric here. But um, but anyway, for the average soldier, see the rule six of the average Roman soldier, six divided into the distance of the fish. And if he was five feet tall, that equals 30 feet. That's where I thought it came from. But it is kind of neat where all this historical stuff comes from in our sport. And there's a lot of this stuff on on AI and this whole regeneration of these ideas that are already antiquated and obsolete, but they keep getting repeated. I hear it, you know, on the road so much with this came up and we were out in Denver, actually, in a class. And somebody asked about so-and-so's leader from 1930 or 40. And it's like they had all these graduation, you know, tapers for basically because they had an inferior material called gut and we don't use gut anymore we use what monofilament and i mean that totally replaced all those formulas but i it's so funny to see people that you think are and you know should know but it just keeps getting repeated and with the mono like it is now you could take three pieces of mono and boom be down to your tippet and you don't need to step it down by thousands of an inch like people think it's just so ridiculous but the, the problem is like this library in back of me, that's all fishing books. My grandfather's library, plus all the stuff I've accumulated in my lifetime. And the crazy thing is, is like nobody ever questions like that's the common sense 101 of the sport, isn't it? I mean, if you talk to Davey about that, I'm sure Davey would say, yeah, it's because I had gut. Now we have this, yeah. but that's not getting repeated by the millennials whatsoever. So there's a lot of ignorance still today in our sport because people read it from an old book in the thirties long before they had the mono. And then it gets to be all this ridiculous jargon repeated. And I just think it's 
it almost makes you chuckle coming back home every time. But they just didn't think it out, you know? Do you have you a run little into that a lot? A, a little bit, especially in Steelhead, because obviously we love the history of it. It's very romantic, you know, thinking back yeah. to the Hag Brown days. But do you have a little bit of rebellion in you towards um tradition? Did you have did you were you facing that stigma often in your career? No, I was lucky. I got taught my granddaddy was smart. Like he got to watch uh he was way into casting. He was also way into golf. Like he taught my mama's my mama's boyfriend at the time, which was my dad, had a golf when he was still in college in St. Louis. And so they were both like real serious about doing that. But he got to see Marvin Hedge do the double haul in 1934 when he broke all the records, you know, for, with the double haul. It's the first time it'd been unleashed for the world. And so when I got to be like 14 or 15, he flew me out to Idaho to spend a week with uh, Jim Green. So I had like some really good mentors when I was young, even though I had all these other ideas about doing the, what I call the funky stuff about piles and tucks and curves. Like I was playing with all these recipes of, of doing that stuff before that stuff was common. And little did I know when I did all that, you know, when I came out with that, when I was in college, I, I think it published in like the early nineties, but most of that work was done in the mid seventies. You know what I'm saying? And even then it was like, people were like, Oh my God, like they hadn't, all they had was like an aerial reach man in a power overpowered, underpowered cast, but there's lots of ways to do that stuff. So when I came out with that, I didn't really know it at the time, April, but it opened a lot of doors for me. It really did. Like with clubs, with more, more speaking things, more, um, more of like with the shows, like the big shows, like getting the spots to do that when I was like, pretty young so i so, think it was a good thing who figured that out were you where were you learning a lot of this you know reach men's and aerial casting and, and all the different trick casts if you will were you figuring those out on your own or were you i did it always going to sleep yeah i do it always like meditation right before i go to sleep like you get to somewhere you couldn't solve it and you couldn't solve it. So you close your eyes and you're about to go to sleep. And always my best thinking is like, even when I was a kid, is where your subconscious starts to teach the conscious what it is. So I'd wake up and write just maybe a couple of words. And then I'd grab the rod the next day when daylight hit. I'd grab it and get out in the yard. I'd be like, I got it. Then I'd go back out to the spot. You know what I mean? In East Tennessee. But I, there's a lot of problems to solve in casting, isn't there? I mean, it's not just... I think to a lot of people, they think something as basic as casting, they think it's just get it out there, but it's not about getting it out there. It's about having the intent and layout and all the cool things you want of what you're trying to do. And that, that really wasn't talked about all that much. Even looking back at the old books, some skews and Halford and, you know what I mean? They don't talk a whole lot about the intent of layout, do they? It's more about like, here's the fly. And uh, you know what that's going to do for people. I mean, you can have the perfect fly all day long. I don't believe there is a perfect fly, April. No, I don't either. Personally. But with casting, I just yes, have a couple. Everything can be so linear, you know, and, and I do want to really geek out on some of these casts in a minute. But um, again, with my my brain being in a sequence, what, what, what was the conclusion of your theory? With about About casting in general? Uh, no, with the distance as opposed to, you know, when compared to the size of the average man. Oh, back to the 30 foot dilemma. Uh -huh. Well, Gary burst my bubble and said, well, it came from the chalk stone streams because they weren't any wider than 30 feet. So it, oh. he says we got it from England. Okay. So there went my whole thing about thinking that it was the rule of six and the average Roman soldier that walked a thousand paces to equal a mile. Some reason I just thought, because there is so much of our history with things like that of these systems in this country that that go back to things that go thousands of years before and i thought well i mean i know who did it byron gregor is the one that did it with uh, leon chandler from Cortland, but that's who came up with it for afma but it really needs to get revamped it's so far out of control now that i don't know if it'll ever come back i mean i got a lot of friends that are working on afma in america and on the board, and I keep asking, man, what are y'all doing? Like 20 years has slipped by. Nobody's revamping nothing except saying pick up plastic out of a river, which is a great cause. I'm not saying that's a bad cause, but I thought this was about making rules and regulations for a sport that we love, you know? 
So picking up plastic, we could do that and a lot of other conservation minded things. What would you focus on? I'd revamp the whole rod line thing right now because it's out of control. It's, it's so mess. ridiculous that yeah. I'm doing stuff in lessons all the time with casting schools where people are coming from far away and putting like seven weight lines on five weight rods to balance them out where they're medium. And I shouldn't be having to do that, but it's so far out of control right now that unfortunately I do. It so is it's like this year. arms race, both yeah. directions. And it is a 20 year problem. You're right. Because this show has been on now for 10 years. This is the 10th season. And yeah. it is something that probably every, every dozen episodes, somebody complains about. And it's been I'm going not on complaining for Because I understand matching gear really well. Mm -hmm. The problem is to the average instructor out there that doesn't know how to match gear as well, or lo and behold, the consumer that doesn't have a clue about it. So they pay a grand or 15, they pay all this money for a rod, pay all this money for a line that says it's supposed to match it. Then they take it to somebody that knows casting and right away they tell me you got the wrong setup. Cause they do, they got the totally wrong mismatch gear to let them function at their best. And as soon as you put them on the right, when they think you're like a, they're like, April, you're a rocket scientist. But the, the <laughs> problem is there's not enough written about matching gear. And people don't understand really what that entails. But if you look back at the actions we got to throw and like even the early HMG rods from Fenwick, but in the 80s, the early Sage, the brownie rods that were like discovery rods, the light line Sages, all those that were medium rods. And then ever since, what have they, I'm not picking on, I better not say that, but now they're stiffer than a dog's hind leg. I would, I would take one if you gave it to me now, because I've not seen one I like. It's very, very hard to find medium rods these days. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Because most of these companies have sold their soul to the devil to make them stiff as a broom. And it's like most people that are casting geeks, I don't know of a casting geek out there, world-class one that, that would advocate a stiff, fast rod. Zero. Yet the consumer buys it because it sounds cool. So, I mean, guess I guess that's our good duty to inform them that that's the wrong decision. They just don't know better yet. Yeah. Does that make sense? I, yeah, I guess that's it, good to talk about it. It's also a common subject on the show because I feel the exact same way. I'm just kind of sitting here silently nodding because I'm in complete agreement. But it's I'm yeah. just going to go back to the math on something. I was giving someone a spay lesson the other day, and I was thinking about this. I've been thinking about this for 15 years, but I wanted to run it by you. Maybe you'll pop my bubble. So I've noticed over the years that tall guys tend yeah. to, they either have their, they do their sweep and create their D loop with their elbows really low, way too low and come back to, into home position at their shoulder length. Yeah. Or they lean forward and try to get as low to the water as they can because they're so much taller that if you factor in the average belly of say they're shooting, every, everyone nowadays is on say between a Skagit or a Scandi line. Because they're so tall and they're standing up to their knees, they're popping their anchor. Yeah. And so tall guys have the same problem in my experience. And so I've always had to explain, you know, just um, maybe have a slightly longer line or have some extra line in the in your running line coming out of your rod tip or maybe wait yeah. up deeper. Where did they come yeah. up with the proportions from um, with the rod length? Does that have something to do with the average man being a certain size? No, I mean, going back to like Alexander Grant's rods over in uh, a buddy named Allie Gowans in Scotland, the mm -hmm. one who threw like the broke the what 195 and 1895 on Lock Levin. That's still like a hero. I mean, that's that's a huge, huge mark in, in casting, especially for spay casting. But right around that same time period, nobody ever talks about these people, but Walter Mansfield was the tournament caster it in california i think at golden gate at the time but this is another incredible feat because this is this is way before anybody hauled the line yet and he threw us the average of five cast an average of 133 feet just casting a line back and forth with a single-handed rod i mean just think of how impressive that is without hauling it and so yeah. i mean people think that all these new gizmos and gear have made the world a better place i would argue no i don't think so because it didn't get broken until um you know that that record stood for over 120 years that alexander grant did so how good were the casters for 120 years not as good as him 
So what's that tell us? And he's using green heart wood with a shiplap joint on a, on a, on the rod, you know, that he built. And he was a violin maker. So he tuned that rod to the key of A. So it actually gets pretty fascinating because the key of A is 440 hertz. So it's actually way deeper. That Like there's a lot of people that believe that tuning stuff like that, you know, like a tuning fork, because I'm a musician. When I did my rod study at Western Carolina, I actually tuned all the rods too, just to have the data for the first, second, third frequency of what would activate it. How do you? So I hooked it up. I, I put them all on oscilloscopes and I put a digital function generator and shook the rods till I found the sweet spots of the harmonics. Oh. But I think, I think Grant was onto something to be honest with you way back then. That's the reason I wanted to, to do the frequency of where the first, second, third harmonic is. Cause that tells you a lot about a rod. You know, most people just say, well, how much does it bend when you hang a weight on it? That doesn't tell me anything about the rod if I'm going to like casting it. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. And my dad, my dad's a luthier. So this is making, you are speaking my language right now. So when yeah. you're, is it because of energy transfer and the harmonics are able to let you see the, the like, to explain it to it's me. It's going to tell you where it's lively. Cause I do it all the time with seeing if you're going to like a rod. So it shows, I mean. It's, it's nice, like at Edison and Denver and these big shows, they've got every make and model. It's like going and you got every make and model there if you want to try it. So first thing I'll do, and I'll look at something and I'll just pick it up and I'll shake it. And I'll be like, no, nah. it just bends up at the top. I'm like, I'm not going to like that. That makes So what if, I, if I activate it, people say, you've heard this a lot, I'm sure, over the years. People say you can't tell anything by shaking it. I beg to differ. I've shook so many rods. I've got a lot of rods. I've got... I mean, I've gotten rid of a bunch of rods too that I don't like, but you can tell a, a whole bunch about a rod by just grabbing it and shaking it. And I'll tell you that I like throwing it before I ever rig a line on it, just by what it does when I shake it. How fast it dampens, you know, when you're done shaking it and bam, it comes back to straight. It's not going like this still like a pogo stick. That's telling you something too. It means the swing weight and all that's way out of whack if it keeps moving, right? The tip's too heavy. It's not going to feel good to hold it up all day, but uh, that's why you pay a high dollar for a lot of these really high dollar ninja sticks is because they do what they recover quick. That gets rid of this. Like when you make a cast on the rod leg of the little waves going down it, you know, if it recovers quick, but there's a lot with, with all this rod rod stuff. But I think Grant was the first one because he was a luthier. He built violins and I play Celtic fiddle. And it's like somebody that's building violins for a living and then going out and throwing the kind of, kind of cast that he did in 1895 is still some of the most impressive things on the planet today when we look at the history of where that all came from. But we're talking overhead casting. We're not talking spay cast at this point. No, that was a D loop. What he did that, with that, that was, was that was a D loop, 195 foot cast on lock 11. Yeah. The reason it got broke by Scott McKenzie is because Scott McKenzie's the one on the Karen team in Scotland that started throwing a V loop. And that's the only reason it got broken. And then Scott broke the 200 foot mark, but we're only talking five feet further with a V versus a D. So how much difference is it? Not a lot, but it's a little bit, huh? Yeah. But those are like world. I mean, those are world-class, you know, distances for that, but everything has a limit to growth. It's just cool. It's really cool when you look at what separates something just by a couple of feet further, a hundred years later, you know? Can we talk a little bit about some of the casts for people who have no idea what we're talking about when we say aerial mends? Yeah, that'd be good. The um, So a mend, anytime we're talking about a mend, you've made a cast, like we use a lot, like for single-handed rod or s something simple like Statue of Liberty and then pull a trucker's horn, okay? Because even in that movie, that was cool watching that Men in the Line movie because the guy had the, the star character had the three point grip, which is what we teach a lot. And there's a reason behind all that madness because you could talk like this whole podcast just on grip and why we got these opinions. But they body block. So everything, one of the best coaches I think in North America that I've been, I spent a lot of time with over the years is, is probably Corich, Chris Corich out in um, Oakland Casting Club. And he's the one that taught Maxine McCormick when she was little bitty, but everything that he uses in coaching, his light years ahead of most instructors is all about body block and human movement. So when he looks at something, he'll come up and maybe move your big toe. If you have say your right foot in front, who might move your toe in an inch 
to change the way your hips align for what you're doing in your casting. Most instructors never get to the body block positioning like what he does. But so we'll talk about those casts. But like a lot of times you'll hear somebody say, well, it's kind of like in uh, one of the guys that works the school with me, his daddy always would tell him when he was playing little league baseball, get your elbow up. But he never knew why. And that's not what you do to be a major league hitter. It doesn't have anything to do with it. But you hear that a lot in fly casting saying, put your thumb on the back. Then you go, where's the rod point now? People aren't smart enough when they're brand new beginners for their proprioception to cast like a ninja with basic skills. So we do things on purpose to body block it to where now where's the rod? It has to be here because the way I'm holding it. And there's a V back here. The thumb's not on the back, but the, the forearm itself will give the brand new student. I mean, we could talk about those things all day, but there's a reason why people have processes of delivering casting sermons the way they want to deliver it for the reason that it body blocks the student to where we get a more positive result in the first 10 minutes of the lesson. When you say body block, you're talking so that you don't have some sort of, you know, unnecessary rotation. Is that why? Yeah. And just straighter movement, stopping the rod in the appropriate place. It's hard for a beginner. I mean, you could do it. I could do it, but we could take a rod and point it back here and point it all the way in front and still throw a beautiful cast, but it's because we know how to move through that, that amount of rod arc. Does that make sense to, mm -hmm. I mean, we could take a massive arc and still throw something nice, but for the basic new person, getting that acceleration right through such a big arc is a dangerous thing because they're probably just going to lollipop it like a big rainbow and it's going to land in a big pile. The funny thing is like even in casting schools on the road, and this is really oh so true for everybody's journey. When they started, they threw a lot of junk. Let's just call it junk. And they caught a lot of fish. Then they took a lesson and they, this is, I've seen a lot of people go through this and they get a lesson. And then all of a sudden they just want to throw laser beams, 30, 40 feet dead straight everywhere they go. And all of a sudden they don't catch stuff at all up top anymore. Cause they drag, they drag everywhere they go. They drag it, drag it, drag it. Then they're like, man, I paid April all this money for the lessons. Now I throw laser beams and I mean, they start realizing then this is part of the, the steps I think in everybody's progression, you know? So it's kind of like, there's a stage, like I did an article years ago. One of the guys I had in a school was the top sales trainer for like IBM. And he right. talked a lot about the first stage is when we're throwing junk and having fun with the big smile, catching lots of fish is basically unconscious incompetence. You're not I even conscious big, of your incompetence. Smile. <laughs> yeah, but then stage two is after they took the lessons and start zipping it out straight and think they know something about it. It's conscience. Now they're conscious, consciously incompetent. Does that make sense? Because now yeah, they think yeah. they're doing good, but they're still incompetent because now they're not doing what? Getting adrift. So then number three, they try to go a little deeper. This is where they jump in if they ever get that far to say, I want advanced line control. I don't want to be doing this stuff by accidents, but I want to do it intentionally. And then the fourth stage is where, where you get to in a long career of doing this and being a geek is literally the unconscious competence where it's flow state, like tiger playing golf, casting, never thinking about looking at a water current and already doing the drift you need because you knew what the currents did before you ever threw the cast. Then it just flows from you, but there is no thought process to do that. Everybody wants to get to that flow state, but they got to go through stage two and three before they get to the stop sign of flow. And unfortunately, I don't know. I think it's different other places because I see a lot of really serious students of the game. Like a lot of them in Europe are a little bit more serious. And this came up at one of the shows at dinner. And I remember Gary brought it up and I said, well, that's real easy. I mean, look at America. You got half the millennials playing pickleball and golf and 50 other things and trying to fly fish on top of it. The reason America is like the master of none of these trades is they got way too many hobbies. So I would argue it's the same in kayaking and elite levels, everything in the world. I think that people don't commit with a growth mindset to actually master something because they dabble with a lot of things. And so to me, fly fishing was always too important as a kid to dabble with too many other things. Is there a sport that complements it? Music. Another I want to say music. <laughs> Another commonality on the show, believe it or not. We talk about this all the time. But tell, well, tell, a lot, tell me why. A lot of my world-class friends that are instructors, that are world-class teachers, are also musicians. Yes. I could go on and on. Did you know Borger plays guitar? Like, we rented a guitar and put a concert on out there 
at the Pleasanton show four years ago, and he rented one for me from some guitar place. But Dave Blackburn was there from the Kootenay River, and we played music that night at the hotel. And I mean, Watton's a banjo player. I mean, I play banjo too. But when Davey came here, we played a lot of music. But everybody I know, pretty much just about everybody I know that's been in this sport for a long time that likes this sport, music's the biggest compliment to it. Because all my friends in Europe that are casting instructors, guess what? They're all musicians. What's the likelihood of that? I'm telling you, it is a shocking amount of people. So what do you think it is? And we talk about this all the time. Why is it? I, I mean, apart from the obvious. I think timing, because we have impeccable timing being musicians. If you can play crooked time, like in Celtic fiddle music, and we play a lot of crooked time stuff, which is different syncopation. It's not just one, two, three, four. I think people that can play like Celtic music or, I mean, a lot of types of music, but bluegrass and Celtic music have a lot of crooked time. And if you can catch the downbeat playing out of crooked time and know where the song's going, guess what? You got, I mean, casting like one, two, three, four is easy, isn't it? Because anybody can go like, you'd think anybody, until we used to play at a lot of concerts and realize the crowd can't clap on the downbeat. Then you realize, if you wonder why a lot of people struggle with casting, because they lack, they lack basic rhythm in their body to begin with. And that's why casting's going to give them a heck of a challenge. It really is, because so all true, the musician yeah. kids I've ever taught, guess what? The musician people, they seem to get it real quick, because the casting's so timing-oriented that something as simple as you was talking about, to throw a snap cast, to sweep the rod up into a D loop, but not let the, the anchor leave the water, and then turn it around wherever you want to go. To me, that is just like so basic, fundamental of a simple timing move but when you watch people try to get that timing to do that it's going to take them years to master years because they can't copy what i just showed them they think they got it they could watch you do it a hundred times but their timing is not the same you, you follow me and it's like al al has a great my buddy al burr out in salem oregon he used to always talk about it and i use his language a bunch when i'm teaching this when we're talking about things like that are dependent on power, like the ghillie cast, like a figure of eight, like this to come up. The rod's always either in or out of power. And that way we can talk to the poets, the engineers, and everybody. If I say it's out of power, then this freaks the engineers out. They go, well, Mac, it can't be out of power because you're moving. And I'm like, no, just go with the flow. Let's do this like Bob Dylan, like we're teaching Bob Dylan to do this. Because Bob Dylan's going to get it really quick. Why? Because he's a musician. Does that make sense? So a yeah. circle, a circle is the perfect thing to talk about in and out of power. We don't take a circle and put it up in the air and just whirly bird it at the same rate. We accent different points, slow, bam, there's the flick, come back here, slow, flick. We got two points that are opposing one another, even though it's a perfect circle where we're still doing the 180 principle, throwing circles. And people don't really get that unless they start throwing some circles. You know what I mean? And getting up and playing with it. But no, I think it's timing, April. What do you think it is? I mean, I think, it's, you... I think it's timing because it's not just me. I mean, it's music in general. So being a musician, but also dancing. I mean, look at Joan, right? She's a dancer. Yeah. Um, I got I to gotta tell you a story about a dancer real fast. We had a little, a young lady named Amy Moran from Chicago. She was at the Denver show a few years ago. And a buddy of mine goes, Matt, can you give her a lesson? She works for Alter, uh, fly fishing now but this is funny so i give her a lesson and within just a couple minutes i mean she's cooking she's row casting off the end of the pond she's looking like a rock star and i was i had to go teach a class so when i come back i was curious like what did the, what did she do before before because that was one of the best lessons the whole year on the road uh, two years ago when i met her well she was the world champion irish flat foot dancer if you wonder why she could pick this rod up and make it look like it could go anywhere she had phenomenal proprioception. All you had to do is tell her something to do it, and she'd copy you. Of course, she made you feel like this, April. I was like, wow. When I walked off, I thought, I wish every lesson would be like that. But <laughs> every lesson's totally different for that reason. You get somebody like that who's the world champion flat foot dancer. Then you get the next lesson with the person who can't even hit their hands when they try to clap. You know, then you got the person that still can't find the downbeat on music. So just think how separate you could write a whole thing about here's four students and why all four of them are so radically different 
when, when I went to college for music and one of the things that I always found interesting was we would start together clapping to a metronome, right? And yeah. everybody, even without the metronome, within the space the span of 10 seconds, not everyone, you would assume that everyone would be on, you know, in sync, but they're not. Everyone starts to kind of um, stagger off. off. Yeah. So yeah. E even nah. in, in music class and the amount of people, even in music that I saw who had no um, timing or rhythm was shocking. So you've got to assume yeah. that it's a, a small amount of musically talented people who really get Oh, yeah. It. That's the ones teaching the world, I think, for the yeah. most part. Yeah, even Simon, like when we taught up there, there a couple of years ago, Simon was telling me he was taking up the guitar. This is when he was like 55. And right. I was just like, and I've been playing all my life. I started playing Celtic fiddle at five. And I told him, I said, man, you're starting a wee, wee bit late. And, and he goes, yeah, I'm getting lessons. I said, yeah, but it's not going to help because you're starting really late. So I saw him this last winter, asked him how the guitar goes, man, it's really going, it's rough. But yeah. he's, but literally what I'm saying, it, and I'm not saying it in a bad way, but it's tough to pick up playing fiddle or guitar at 55. Oh, yeah. Or Absolutely. 60. It's it's almost hopeless because I got another buddy in Florida that's doing it. He's taking lessons and he's like, he's like 64. And I laughed when he told me he's taking up the guitar, which I'm not trying to discourage anybody, but literally the learning curve, if you, I mean, literally both the kids play a lot, like mandolin and guitar and stuff. They started doing that at two years old. By the time they're already 17, 20 years old, I mean, they're like, they know how to play it. You got to start that stuff young. Yeah. And I really think casting's a good thing to start young too. I started both my boys at a year and a half old. Casting. Yeah. So. Yep. Same. We're doing the same. It's just a little bit of muscle memory. And it's amazing. They don't need to cast every day. I'm, I'm looking at our little kid's rod there. I get Adelaide to yeah. pick it up and, and just do 10 minutes of casting a day. And Oh, yeah. It's, and it's th that little amazing. NPR rod is perfect for a little kid. Yep. Let's talk yep. about that real fast for other people that have little kids. Yeah. Both the boys, we taught them with single-handed rod. They held it two-handed until they were 11 years old. And they could get the most wicked stops by holding it two-handed for the leverage factor about putting this top hand lower. You know what I'm saying? For the fulcrum to be above, but lower and closer to the effort. Mm -hmm. We're trying to break this right now in her. Oh, but it, it's like they can do some, you'll be shocked how, how wicked a stop when she gets just a little bigger, so she can do by having two little bitty hands on it and your one hand. So maybe I will put her back on the two hands. The problem was is she's been she was spay fishing all year and caught her first steelhead on the spay. So now every time she picks it up, she wants to do spay casts. And so I've had I've had yeah. to explain. Okay, so maybe what I'll do is I'll let her have the two hands, but we'll still do up and down overhead cast. Yeah, you can do pick up and lay down and all that with with that as well. But right. there's a lot of recipes for. I just think when they get those fundamental movements. At such a young age. And I, I thought about it because I, when I was doing the stuff for, with Sage years ago, Randy, who was Doug Swisher's son, he was doing a lot of them with me on the road. And then several years later, Jason and I, Gary's son, did a lot of them with me on the road. Right. But then I look at who their daddies were. And that's why when my kids were that little, I really wanted them to cast like well, like not just like average. You know what I'm saying? I wanted to, they liked it. So what I do is bribe them in the yard. You pull out a, back when they were little, I'd do a quarter. Then it got to be a dollar. You know what I mean? Like eight, 10 years old. All right, kids, we're going to have a casting competition. You tell them what it is and put a dollar out there. And they're real competitive. They're three years apart, but both boys, they competed with one another for that dollar. Well, then a dollar wasn't enough because they got 10 years old and a dollar wasn't anything for them then. But I think a, a fun way to do it is keep like short, short sessions and keep like you know, 10 to 12 minutes, but mm -hmm. keep it like three times a week. It's yep. short sessions and that's, it's that's... shocking how much they'll grow. Yep. We, yeah, it should we, be a little. We ninja. alternate it. Yeah. So she's got, yeah. she does archery for 10 minutes one day and then casting for 10 minutes the next archery casting. But um, I like your idea of incentive. That's a great idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Give a little incentive is sweeten the pot. Then when she gets a little bigger, she's going to bankrupt you. Cause then my kids were like, daddy, how about a 20? I'm like, <laughs> yeah, no, right. that's too much, <laughs> but it I... is good. <laughs> It's good, like having two hands on it when they're little, though, because it is heavy. It's kind of heavy. Yeah. Having an eight, even an eight footer, it's still too heavy for little hands that big. Like yeah. my hands are huge. Like, I mean, as far as like just the size of them compared to when they were small. And it gives them, I learned a lot. I learned a lot, you know, as much as I teach, watching how little bitty hands could hit these wicked stops. I have to send you a video. I'll send you a video when they're five years old. You'd be like, oh my God. The stops they're hitting, though, are so elite. 
at such a young age, once you get them to stop where they're supposed to do it and use and, the leverage off that bottom hand. And I was going to ask, what do you attribute it to? Is it the bottom hand? Is it, oh, yeah. is it your driver yeah. or, or is it because of the actual muscles in their hands? I had them using that bottom hand a lot when they were small and they'd pick it up, like get into that same pose of Statue of Liberty. And this top one's just there to stop it. And that bottom one would punch out to, to do all the work there and there. They'd pull it back and punch it out. You know what I mean? So they were getting all that pretty much off that bottom, but, but it was, uh, it was a lot of fun to watch it. I mean, it, it was, it was kind of neat when they were that age. Won't get that yeah. again until they have kids and we can start all over. Yeah. And Cause you now know, they're getting big. And it could sound selfish teaching our kids something that we love, but I will say, you know, my dad's a very talented guitar player and yeah. musician. And I regret so much that I never learned how to play guitar because now I'm not going to be learning how to play. And if he had given me a 10 oh, there's still lesson, hope. No, they still could do it. No. Well, our fine. other favorite female artist is Joni from up there too. Okay. Right. Okay. When I was little, I had a huge, huge crush on Joni all my growing up years. Yeah. And it's like, she's just so, so creative with all of the open tunings and what happened with all that, with the, with that generation of music was from her, having polio when she was little so she couldn't oh, play chords that. like a normal you know what i'm saying so she could yeah. she could bar chords so she tuned the guitar and that's how she started dating like crosby and graham nash all these different people at the time because she was so talented by rearranging the way the guitar was played by open tunings so she was a mastermind in open tuning everybody just thinks it's a a song or a hit hit you know that she did but she was hugely revolutionary for guitar players in the world. I didn't know that. Yeah, including me. Like I was open tuning stuff all the time because, oh, this is Joni's tuning. And then I realized as I got older, that's why she did all that. Because I was learning to play, you know, mostly in standard tuning when I was pretty young. So that's the, that's the crush everybody had on Joni was all of her open tuning stuff, you know? Yeah. Uh, come back to Ariel Men's. We were starting that. Now, this will be on YouTube so people can see you. Someone who yeah. has never heard of this before, they they have no idea. They just learned what a mend is. What is an aerial mend? Why would you use it? How is it done? All right, here we go. Aerial mend. So you make your cast. Boom, you made your cast. You stopped in front. So the loop's well on its way. And then your mend is like when you teach it to people, I'll tell it to you like this and I'll explain it. So your first movement would be reach out, reach back. So you can do that really slow. You can be chill. You can wait all the time you need. And what that's going to do is put the mend right below your rod tip, which, of course, that doesn't do you much good because the business ends where? Way out far at the fly end. So then you'd be like, hmm, that was a little too slow. So then you'll make another one and you'll reach out, reach back. Now your mend's out there in the middle somewhere. See, let's say you had a slow current and you had a fast slot, like a fast seam coming in, down the middle on each side. And then you had slow current on the other side. Now you got this big hump going up the river. And that's from speeding it up. But where you really want it on, say, a river like the, like that movie, Mending the Line, was on the Yellowstone. That's a lot of laminar flow on the Yellowstone. You look out, and it's just kind of all moving pretty similar speed when you look out at water that big. So then you'd want to do it like speed it up to where you'd stop, and it'd look like this, reach out, reach back. See the hand? Now it's at the fly end. So now you got this giant question mark 40, 50 feet out where there's – 15 feet of line above the dry fly directly upstream, where now we can look at our watch and go 20 seconds drag free float. And that's all an aerial men just by speeding it up to hit, hit this right when you stop. But there's a reason, like when you teach this to your little girl, this she'll get it right away for this reason. First have her do it, April, reach out, reach back. Let her be chill about it and put it right here. And then you'll tell her, the more you practice it and it's right here, she'll speed it up on her own. And then she'll be putting it out in the middle don't even show her the one out at the fly until she's done a bunch of them in the middle. Does that make sense? Cause it's hard uh -huh. for people to go like that. You see my hand, that's the hand speed it takes and anybody can do it. But the problem is the myelination for them to copy my hand speed there is they haven't done it enough where they feel like, then they want to come back too slow. Right. Does that make sense? So that's yep. a good example of, of reach out, reach back. That's an aerial man. And the part that messes with people's head, is that would be a question mark because when I go out, I'm going out fast. Think of it like this since you're a spay caster. You're throwing a snap perpendicular to the way it's running out. That makes sense. So your cast is launched, 
but you're throwing a snap cast perpendicular to what's going on out there. So with a snap, you'd usually go slow to fast. To turn this to the left in the question mark, we're going out fast and coming back slow. So it's the momentum of the tip. Now here, let's reverse this one step further, not to confuse the new people watching an aerial men. But what happens if I go out slow and come back fast? Now I've turned a cast goes out 90 degrees to the right, the exact opposite of the question mark. Aha, so maybe some of our icons weren't correct when they said the line always does what the tip does. So here, let's take that a step further. The rod tip establishes the momentum of what it is you're trying to do. Momentum comes from speed, whether you go slow to fast or fast to slow. You're, that, that kind of you're makes frying sense. my brain right now. It, this is really exciting. It wasn't until moving down here and fishing New Zealand when I really started to need these sorts of presentations. Yeah. And and admittedly, you know, I still am slow enough where I have to be like, okay, if I want to have the mend in the front part of the line, I need to put the movement in here. But I never, right. I never factored in though the speed in which it was done. I mean, I knew that the speed would matter and the distance would matter and how big it was going to be. That's right. The amplitude of how big it is is about what you just did, how far you reached out, but also huh. the quickness of how fast you go out. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, but talk to me through about fry my brain again slowly about going in the opposite direction. So years ago, when I started doing these on the road, there was always there was always people that would be on the road that would say the line always goes where the tip goes, and they'd walk out there and just go bam, and the line would go out there and curve. Mm -hmm. Well, here's the thing: it's only because he went fast to do that motion with my finger. Does that make sense? Yes. What happens if I do it like this? Watch my hand now. What happens if I do it that slow? It's a curve the opposite direction. Everything you do in casting is really about the momentum you establish, which means the speed that you do it at. Hang on. So, but but that line will follow at the slow speed. It just takes longer to get there. But it can't get there because gravity is going to outrun you. So it's going to win the race. before it hits the water, right? So it, that's it, right. The asterisk is depending on the distance between you and the water. That's right. Okay. In a lot of ways, but but it's also about speed, just like over and underpowered curves. I mean, snaps. Like I snap a lot. When I first met Al, this was funny. Bob Meadow from California. There was some really good folks spay casting at one of the big fairs. Of course, I was at, I mean, I didn't even have a spay rod at the time. I was just going to watch it because it was cool. So I had a lot of single malt whiskey and stuff on the show. So I was just sitting there sipping that and watching them do this. Well, this, this dilemma came up where they wanted to go way to the right, but the line's way out here. And they wanted to set something up, pull a D loop back against it and send it there. And the funny thing was I'd already snapped a lot before I ever knew snapping was even a spay thing. You follow me from under? You can go under and over. You can come over and under. Uh -huh. Depending on how you do it, it's going to give you a kick. If you do it from coming over the top and then going underneath, you'll get a curve cast on your anchor setup. Does that make sense to you? So if yeah. I have an anchor laid at you, like on the screen here, like you, mm -hmm. and if I go over the top and then reach under, it's going to come back here and turn back and around me. So voila, then I can peel this off the water, peel this up, and I'm already set with the anchor pointing where I'm getting ready to go. Okay. That yeah, dictates yeah, I gotcha. I gotcha. whether you go up and over or under and up. Hang on. Up and over or under and up? Under and up. Up and over. It's going to go straight. But if you up and over, if you up. I didn't mean to say that. Think of it like this. When you lift, come here at this yeah. level and uh -huh. come back below it. And that'll kick. That's what I'm saying. Do the, do the slow part coming back up high and then do the fast part underneath. Does that make sense? I'm try I'm almost there. So do But the you'll get it. You'll throw a 90 in a yard, even with a single handed rod. You're gonna see it going back, and then be like bam and a huge kick, 90 degrees. So okay, what so it does, it opens up a 90 degree angle change. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's actually a lot easier just to do that. I mean, I mean, we have to teach this single spay, double spay, and all this stuff all the time, but but it actual fishing scenario, it's a lot easier to just snap and have the anchor where you just lift and peel and go. Okay, so do it. It's easier. So tell me which side of the river you're on, and then if you wouldn't mind, could you demonstrate it for me, what what you're thinking? In okay, case so you're on the river left side, right? No wind. Let's say no wind. We're not going to complicate it for the people watching. Yeah. And if you, if you lift and you come over the top here, uh -huh. 
and then turn down and go underneath. It's going to, the anchor's going to come back around here and turn that way and back up on my right. But do the whole cast with delivery. And let me just watch this because I can see the line. It's going to be like this. You ready? So here's an ink pen. That's going to be my spay rod. Just imagine it's connected. So if you did this and came over the top, and snapped here. That's uh-huh. going to kick and back of me. Now I lift and peel to oh, here. Oh, yeah. I do it all the time. I thought I, 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 I thought you were doing in the under on your forward delivery, and that wasn't working for me. But you're talking about the actual snap. Yeah, the snap is getting it all set up to where <laughs> instead of snapping it straight up the river, we got it snapped in back of us. Does that make sense? Stop. I thought you were saying snipe. And I was like, what is a snipe? Is it like a snaky thing? Oh, no, no. No, we got oh, it my now. Oh, God, that is so funny. Your snap. Your snap. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, snapping. Yeah, no, yeah, but, yeah. you know, I didn't even know it was called snaps back years ago. I mean, playing with those years ago as a kid was fun. I was like, this is really cool. Then I started yes. realizing it's all inverted backwards. And even before I ever saw one, like, somewhere you know first time i saw one and realized people had named it like in right. my, when i got older the snipe. i was kind of bummed <laughs> i thought oh i had it going on you've got your own name for it now but i do it all the time when yeah. i'm fishing when i'm fishing heavy flies and i cannot risk a bloody l or any sort of angles in yeah. there i really need everything lined up i i was just doing that in new zealand for for salmon because i was back on some seriously heavy gear but um yeah no yeah. okay i love it so by the way alfred's yeah. book is my favorite book of all time Oh, he's a, Al's one of my best friends. He, he's so, he's so, um, those first few pages in his book, I highly recommend everybody to go read those first few pages. When he goes into the mechanics and explains Al Burr's take on the mechanics of a spay cast, I think it's about the most perfect thing I've ever seen it, in spay casting. It's a pretty serious read. I remember trying to read it when I was younger, because that's right, I ran into Al at one of the conclaves. And at the time I was a rep for Wolfgang Fabiche. And so I I traded him a bunch of tapered leaders for his book. And I I read the book. I couldn't understand the book. And then I put it down for a year and picked it up again and understood it. And then I put it down. I picked it up again. And now it's almost my spay Bible. I hate to. Yeah. No, it's good though. He, he, he's, um, he's so fun. Like he came here and stayed a couple of times for the conclaves here in the Southeast and stayed at the house but every time we get together we don't basically we end up staying up till almost morning to go do our thing the next day at the conclave and same when it, when i stayed with him for the salem morgan show back in i think 2007 which that was kind of intimidating because al goes we want you to come be the ce lead a ce all day long for the spay casters and i'm like but al i don't even own a spay rod he goes it's all right you you got enough things to talk about for spay rod. Back then, I didn't even own a spay rod in 2007. What's CE, not caster exam? Continuing education. Ah, uh, okay. So I went out there and talked a lot about loops and how they work. But it's the same. It's the same thing. I've got a bunch of them. You know, since then, I bought a bunch of different ones that I like, and they're all really medium sticks. But I, I like the, I like the two hand. I just don't have a lot of places to use it. April. If we had more rivers that were like conducive to it, I'd use it. But yeah, if you see where I live, you realize why we don't use it. Because gotcha. <laughs> I don't need it. I don't need it. I can reach everything single fine. But if it, I had bigger water, I took it up to Nova Scotia a few years ago, and that was fun. Fish some of the big rivers up there, and it it was it was a lot of fun. But I don't get to go that many places to use it at right right here lately. But but I do like it. Is there a trick cast? I say trick cast um, has it with. Oh, to make whiskey, to win whiskeys in a parking lot. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, sure. Is there? Well, yeah. yes. Let's. I'll show you. Then. What What is one that will definitely impress your friends? But what's another one that you think that most anglers don't know but should know for proper presentation? So we'll hit two of them. Two of them. Yeah. Well, a good one to win like beverages in a parking lot is just say. You're going to do a 60 foot bow and arrow cast and everybody's going to think that means you're holding the fly and you're just going to let go of the fly and it's not going to go but 15 feet. Well, do the bow and arrow cast by by leaving about 50 feet of line already out on the, on the ground or whatever grass gymnasium floor or the water and just go ahead and grab it here and do your roll cut, get up here like an archer and you got this bow and arrow part tightened up so that when you come down, you're still doing a, a regular roll cast, right? So then blow their mind and do it 60, 70 feet. Then they realize they lost the whiskey and they got to buy you stuff. Okay. So Wait, that's so, the first so one. You're, you're that's a grabbing, good winner for winning stuff. 
But you're only grabbing five feet of line? Well, yeah, I'm loading the rod, though. The difference is my roll cast, my rod's already preloaded to the, I bend it way back where the rod's already folded in two. Yeah. So then when I come into the row cast, the rod's already loaded. Uh, right, it's already it's loaded. I don't have to load the rod because I've already bent it yeah. like really big. Does that make sense? So then it's yeah. a timing game of when I let go with this hand to let it go in front. When do you so let go a, on your rotation? Oh, I can, well, that's what they got to go play with. We don't want to give our secret away because I'm trying to win stuff, April. But um, okay. that's a good one, though. That's a good gimmick. That's a good gimmick cast. Of course, um, a really good one when we get older. We better not give that one away, actually. Hold on. Let me think of another one. What's what's the next one I'm supposed to tell you? No, you can't do that. What's the good one when you get older? All right. When you get really old and you want to know how to do this and do well with it still, handicap everybody. Tell them no hauling, one back cast. Okay? Because an old man will win that every time. Uh -huh. Or an old woman. Does that make sense? The young yeah. bucks with like 30-inch arms, they're going to be up there thinking they can still do it. That's a fantastic one. I've seen that one going back 34 years ago to San Mateo, California. And what's the trick? I missed the trick. Oh, it, I don't know. I mean, I hadn't figured it out. I'm not old enough yet, April. I'm working on that one. Okay. Got but it. I've seen these, I've seen people get up there that are in their late eighties and, and make that call and have like world-class casters all around them and absolutely school them like a redheaded stepchild as soon as they do it. And everybody's <laughs> like, oh man, we've been, we've been high. Because people are so dependent on their hauling and so dependent on all these other things that once you take all that away from them and they got to just literally pick it up and have line control to throw a cast, one back cast, then a forward delivery. It's amazing how much people people fall apart once you handicap them like that. And that's the thing I learned from it at San Mateo. I just thought it was funny because I remember watching it years ago. I mean, I've, I've saw Gary do it a few years ago out in Pleasanton. Gary pulled it off beautifully. And Gary had all these people, like all these world class, big old dis. There's a lot of distance hitters at this thing. And when Gary said it, I knew right away because I'd seen it before at San Mateo. And I said, Gary, I'll go out here and be the judge. And I got way out there. And of course, I was judging everybody. He goes, I'll go first. And he did it first. And everybody that followed, you know, it's it's a pretty good trick. Is it because is it is the trick to have a longer that that you're traveling with your hand longer? into your forward rotation like do you Partly think that too. do you think we Timing handicap too. Our, do you think we handicap ourselves with the hall and we we decrease the length of travel yeah i think for a lot of people but i don't think the world class people do that i, I think the world class people still take maximum stab at hall length and stroke length when you look at the worlds like norway and malam england a few years ago i mean it really was amazing i mean that the distances that were that were had were impressive. You know what I mean? They were really impressive in Milan, even the top 40, the top 40 with a five weight were all like 135 to 144 in Norway. That's, that's hugely impressive. So everybody that, and it's funny, like this whole YouTube stuff, I mean, this new, uh, you know, I just think it's funny. People will just show them. They'll be up there going like this and they'll be like, there's 130 feet. And I'm like, not even close. Cause as a casting geek, like I, I've got really good time and like, I can look at how long something takes and I know how long something takes for you to carry a hundred feet. I know how long that takes already. And when you see it happen in a 40 foot occurrence and they say it was, a, you know what I mean? Some world record distance. I'm like, not even close because it, nobody's going any faster than, than those world elite things that I'm talking about. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. They're exceptional casters. There well, are. There's some really exceptional people out there. And unfortunately, they're not the ones making YouTube. But you know what I mean? Making those videos, which I doubt they will. But it's just funny when you because you see that a lot on reels, too, you know, like Instagram reels. Like, here's Bubba. Bubba just got a new ask with rod. <laughs> Bubba's out in the parking lot. And it'll show that stuff all the time. And I'm just like, I don't even look at that stuff, April, to be honest with you. I don't watch it very much because at my age, I don't really I'm not a big social media fan. OK. Yeah, I totally get it. Um, the yeah. the functioning or the practical cast for fishing. What do you think about those? Because, like I said, I didn't realize exactly how much I didn't know until fishing New Zealand. I, I learned a lot. It was very humbling. Yeah, New Zealand's a lot like here with the with the especially down. You know, we're like, well, I don't want a hot spot. No, never mind. I was going to say some, but I don't want to talk about it anywhere because I just not not into doing that. But but we'll talk about it another time. But New Zealand is very very similar to this part of the country with the fern trees and the amount of lush 
the gradient, you know, coming off like in the South Island with Mount Cook, it's, it reminds me a lot of here. The first time I went down there was in 86. And then I was, I'd spend the winter down. I've spent a lot of winters down there. And I just always thought it looked like here. The difference is the average fish are way bigger than here because they grow, they grow so much faster than in this part of the country. Here, a fish only grows an inch and a half a year. And it dies of old age by the time it's 12, 13 inches. Of course, that'd be a bummer coming from British Columbia. Like You'd be like, man, that's horrible. But they're not as big, but it's the same representation of like for that fish to get that size for the same fish you catch in New Zealand, five to seven pounds, the same intellect. Does that kind of make mm -hmm. it's like the same really intelligence is what I'm saying for like the Browns, because that's mostly what I like. But that's what I chase always when I'm down there mostly is brown trout. But so it is, it's, it's similar. It gives you cast and challenge. It gives you a lot of currents and gradients, but I'd say the biggest thing, is, I think this is back to what you asked me. What's the biggest thing that actually handicaps people the most? I'll tell you what it is because we've done a lot of years at all the casting clubs all over North America. The biggest mistake is to go to the park and practice a pickup and lay down till you're blue in the face and you can't do anything else but that. So you might throw the sexiest, most perfect two foot loops and blah, blah, blah. But if that's all you got, then you got, you don't have the game of intent. What we were talking about. And it's going to be like a foreign, foreign concept to say, here's a snake roll. Here's a snap T followed with a I mean, Jason's book did a lot of that too with modules, but modules are really where it's at. If it's like bacon brownies, say you got some flour, you got some cocoa, here's an egg and here's some sugar. Now, how you're going to choose to mix those ingredients is all up to you, baking the brownie. And it's the same thing, really, in casting. Like, you got these different things. But if all somebody does is goes out and they do this for everything, then what are they going to do when they get down in the bush to New Zealand and they got a bunch of fern trees right in back? Oh, what do you mean? I don't, I don't roll cast. I got a way doing this at the, at the park. Well, I mean, even something as simple as a roll cast. And to be honest with you, the roll cast is not an easy thing for people to perfect. And there's a reason why, because all the lines out in front of you and you got no mass in back of you if you're doing a static row cast. So what is the row cast? Kind of be the devil's advocate of casting would be to say, I would say everybody needs to perfect a beautiful row cast to become a good caster. Because without it, you're not, you're not ever using the get out of jail free card. You know what I mean? With all the different row casts we use in fishing, they don't have the get out of jail free card because it's all an acceleration measurement. And if they don't know how to accelerate the rod, guess what? They're in trouble and they're going to flounder away and dump it and pile it up and all kinds of ugly disasters in front, wondering why it's so difficult. And it's a real simple answer because they didn't ever learn how to accelerate it to begin with. Yeah. And without momentum too. That's right. And it's, it's kind of a conundrum because it's all in, in front. Yeah. They're like, how am I going to make this line in front of me turn over? That, that just blows people's minds. So what happens is, and it's human nature for males, as you know, to go, well, I'm just going to hit it harder. And the harder they try to hit it, what happens? And it makes them look like a total idiot. <laughs> in a real big hurry. And they're just piling it up over and over. But the best roll casters, I mean, they didn't fall off a cabbage truck last week, did they? No. Because I know a bunch of good roll. I mean, there's a lot of good roll casters out there in this world. But unfortunately, that's not the ones that people are learning from. And it's hard so because doing it on the grass obviously makes it tricky too. Yeah, it does. And this came up with the, even the Federation stuff, which I shouldn't say this, but I always prided myself with students who are masters and CIs that I taught over the last 35 years. And now they have it on the exam to say, April, you have to use a cheating tool for you to do this on the exam. And I, I'm not a fan of that personally. Does that Cheating make sense? Because if, yeah, like if you're a good roll caster, I don't think you ought to have to use a crutch if you know a, how to do it. A stake or a grass leader? Oh, they got all those little things like close pins and yeah, okay. that little boards that hold the fluff. So it gives you some resistance and blah, blah, blah. It's all back to the dilemma of like you hear this all the time with roll casting too about saying, you know, people will talk about the, the anchor loads the rod and all these ridiculous things. That has nothing to do with loading the rod, but there's all these little things in our sport unfortunately that got carried down from a long time ago that keep getting repeated you know what i mean that's the problem but to say that you have to use a tool no on grass i mean good row casters can row cast 
with a five weight still 75 feet plus with a five weight on grass all day long. And what's so the to trick? say I got to use a tool, that's not really a fair assessment. What's the trick then? Is it just keeping everything more horizontal? Is it in your road? Is it in your acceleration? What is it? What's the trick in 75 feet on grass? Stopping really high. People think they're going to take a big stab of pie and bring the rod way down here, you know, thrusting like thrust, uh -huh. like an aerial cast to thrust to pull down and push. Yeah. But if we thrust on grass, then we're going to end up having too much slack and pile it up. So the key is stopping that high. But are that you throws a real narrow loop, like a you, lot narrower loop? Are you then starting lower? Is your trajectory starting lower behind you? No, I just lift it up here. This is my stroke plank. See how high my elbow? So if I start up here, here, let me get these pencils here. Oh, that's like right. This. Because if I recall so from look, my from my exam, whoops. it cannot be it can't be dynamic at all, right? It has to be completely static. It has to be static. So look right. at this. If I start way up high like King Kong, now uh -huh. look at my rod tip path. Yeah. So then my stroke plank gets to bring it all the way back down. That's the key. So the biggest problem I see in row cast over the years is people's hands are at their shoulder height. Where's the stroke? There is no stroke. All they can do is rotate. If you try to roll cast a long ways with no stroke length, guess what? It's the recipe for disaster. So, so even like with a spay rod, if we were out there and had our long belly heads on there, like really long heads, man, I'd want to see a spay caster even starting from up here. You follow me? To bring this down, 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 then boom. That's the way you're going to get your stroke length because otherwise it, it's just not going to happen. But people don't modify their stroke a lot. I mean, they just get to here always and think they're going to try to do something bigger with the same shorter stroke. So it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think it's fascinating. I, I can tell a lot by someone's casting by just simply watching if they drift or don't drift. Oh, yeah. Especially yeah. single hand if they drift in a lot. But with the double handed and too, that's I think that's what I, I drift was... a lot with a double hand. Yeah, you know I mean, I, I think that I think that you see people drift a lot once they get into especially like distance i think you got to drift yeah you know but distance for fishing not so much because really the distance fishing i mean i don't know it's that's the hardest thing on the road i just talk on the road i have to always talk about distance being a relative thing for what most people's fishing is going to be and then you hang out with those people that are like tournament casters and they're talking about distances that are like world elite now that's a whole nother ball of wax and that's not the sermon that we ever talk about much with the consumer, because you know what? They're not doing enough practice, that word practice, to even hear the sermon because they hadn't practiced enough of the basic stuff. Does that make sense? So practice yeah. is a big part that's missing, you know? I don't know how to get people. I, th I talk a lot about the podcast here with the articulate flag, Marvin Cash, about mindset. The older I get, the more I'm talking about mindset all the time, more than I am fishing. Because people mindset, they're all jacked up on their mindsets wrong. So how do you get them in a positive, like a growth mindset where they're actually growing? It's harder to do these days, I think, than ever before in our lives. Because there's like pickleball, there's all these distractions. Remember, there's YouTube, there's Instagram. There's all these places people want to go and waste their time. And unfortunately, the, the, the kinesthetic good stuff that they could be developing and putting it into myelination to fire correctly over and over is never getting developed due to the lack of practice, you know, and it's sad, isn't it? They go to the Christmas islands and all these cool exotic places, still not able to double haul, much less casting into a 20 knot wind 50 feet. It's pretty sad. I see this all the time. I see it, the lessons I've run for my whole career. And I'm like, dude, you're wasting your money to pay 25 grand to go to the Christmas islands. You got no business going. But I'm not, I mean, I've, I've told a lot of people that be like, you really got to get this down. But I'm sure those lodges, God bless them. I'm sure they're frustrated to get somebody that comes down and can't do that is seriously a sad state of affairs. Yeah, because then the catch rate goes down and then it's hard for promotion. And it's and like word of mouth. Yeah, it's like the old, the great expectations novel. You remember reading all that, but the great expect, I mean, it's like, that's just not going to happen. So unfortunately, I've, I bet it's that way all over the globe, really, but I'm, I know it's bad here. I mean, because people don't, unless they become like full on into a mindset of growth, most people will never become like a casting geek like they do in golf, you know? Because because what happens in golf is you become a pro. 
I'm serious. You become a pro and you can make all kinds of money as a pro. Here's something sad for casting instructors. Cause I've had, I've had a lot of golf pros and lessons over the years that were well-known golf pros. Their average lesson per hour, 700 bucks an hour. So then you come to a sport like fly fishing and become one of the top instructors in the world in this sport. And people like freak out if you charge 300 bucks an hour. Oh yeah. Does that make that's, sense? They think that's just highway color. robbery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's like highway robbery. But the pros remember this, they're still getting two and a half times more money per hour. And I can tell you this fl- waving a, a fly line on a bendy stick is a whole lot harder than hitting a white ball in a gopher hole. I mean, think about that with all the things you can do with a string on a bendy stick, it's definitely harder. There's way more complexity. And so it's just kind of sad that, that my boys, both of them, like I thought when they were little, Connor might want to do this for, and I'm kind of glad he's going to college and not wanting to do it. Cause I told him, I said, son, I've been lucky in this industry, but you're going to be a lot better off going and finding your way. Cause I don't know if my way would ever work for your way down the road for him. Yeah. Just by the way things panned out, you know, growing up. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't really want him to do it now. So where Even is though your, he loves it. Where's your career at now? What do you mean? I'm about to retire, April. I'm about That's, ready to be done. <laughs> tell me about it. So are you going to take some time off? What are you going to do? No, I'm going to still run my schools because I like the education. I mean, I've, I've run 10 weeks a year of, of uh, schools that are a week long. And I'll still do that. And I'll still keep up with um, the clubs, like doing a lot of the shows and things like that. I'll do that probably for, mm, I don't know how long. I told I think I'll probably only do those maybe another few, maybe five years, but I'm not going to want to stay on to doing shows when I'm 80, 90 years old. I can tell you that. I think at about 65, I'll walk away from, from all that. Cause I've been doing those since I was a kid. I'm, I think it's time to go ahead and maybe do something else when I retire. Any ideas? Fish probably go traveling again a lot. When the little one goes to college, that's three years away. Yep. Probably go back and travel a lot and fish. I want to go. There's a lot of places still I want to, I want to visit. I got to, I got to fish uh, a lot of cool places from when I was doing the racing, like in China, like going up before my goal, doing the timing was cool. I was doing the timing back in the early nineties with, with those races and it wasn't even talked about. So I'd like to go back some places like that, where there's some nomadic people and sleeping out in tents. You know, I, I want to go do some more stuff like that again. Cause I do like, I do like the travel part of it a lot. So that'd be kind of a fun way to retire. I think so. Is yeah. there, is there anything that I've really missed that you wanted to add before we let you get back to your late night? No, whatever you want to ask, I mean, was fine with me. I don't, I'll do better the next time. I'll be more prepared for, for I feel, that, uh, I feel no, like I've, I've enjoyed talking with you though. Cause, cause you had a lot of friends. I remember. Carl talked to me about a few years ago. That's why, that's why I wanted to reach out and get a hold of you because you were doing some stuff with Epic there before too, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. You know, doing stuff right. So that was a good. That was some good. That was good. I mean, because I mean, I like a lot of the actions. I got a lot of those in the teaching, the teaching department here. We've got about twenty of those Epic glass rods that we use a lot for teaching. Yeah. And they're good rod. Great, great for people starting to feel a cast, you know? Okay. So is there yeah. any, is there anything though? I feel like I've missed your whole 50 to sixties. Is there anything in there that I've missed? No, I mean, it's been like raising kids and we get out in the yard, play games for a dollar. It's been busy. I mean, with shows and all that and, and just working, working, working. I guess part of it is too figuring out a way, a different mantra of doing things. And it's like, I guess that's the biggest thing I've done the last 20 years is demand of uh, changing the game. Like if you look at Led Zeppelin and who Peter Grant, when he came to America, like Led Zeppelin was the first successful business band to hit American soil, like way before like Motown and Elvis and all those bands. And Peter Grant was kind of a real demanding manager for Led Zeppelin, sold the Orange Bowl out, they kept all the money. So I got tired when I came into this industry and look and like the biggest icons in the sport would be like, man, April's killing it. If she got a thousand bucks a day, that's the best that you could ever do at this industry. And so I changed that years ago. And I guess that's what's going to help pave the way for somebody else who wants to be an entrepreneur in this line of work. 
but I've run some of the biggest, I've been fortunate to do that, but it, it wasn't by accident. I majored in econ, got a master's in econ. I understand business. I'm not content raising a family saying Mac flew all the way across the universe for a thousand dollars a day. I mean, I can do way better than a thousand dollars a day. Like the classes Borger and I do, we get 10 people, we charge them 600 bucks a day. That's $7,000 split right there alone is better money than saying a thousand bucks a day. The schools I do here, I've been really blessed. I mean, I do a weekend school that's $1,500 a student and that's two days long. And I sold that out last year at 30 people. That's a, that's an income that's never happened in Caston. Yeah. So right. I'm, I'm trying to be the modern day Peter Grant in my business. Does that make sense? Uh, and I, and yeah, I'm doing does. this for the kids, like my kids that could say, daddy, I could actually make a living at this. But if we keep doing it the old way, how it was when I was a kid, mm -hmm. where everybody's got to be a pauper and tripping over dollars to pick up pennies, then nobody's ever going to come into this like a Tiger Woods, are they? No, I mean, I, I would travel. I used to travel for free for a full day. And yeah. then and then I'd get my, you know, if you're lucky, it was $500 for a whole day. And they would use me from 6 a.m. all the That's way through I mean. till 8 p.m. at night and then fly me home the next day for free. Yeah, so it but it's like guide wages. You follow me? We could stay home on the Skeena or the Dean or somewhere cool yeah. and just stay there and fish. That's right. I mean, but that's the thing. That, that's why I want to see it change. And a lot of people go, Mac, you're greedy. And I'm not greedy. I'm not a, I'm not rich by any means choosing this lifestyle all these years. All I'm saying is to pay bills and send your kids to a good university and be able to pay the normal everyday things, then you're going to have to do it different than the old mantra of saying, and I heard that a lot from like, I won't say any name, but just, you know, who was big in America. Mm -hmm. I was at those shows with all of them. Those people thought they were killing it always at that rate, probably because they lived through a depression. Okay. I didn't grow up in a depression. I'm growing up in reality going, nope, if you're going to do this for a living, this is the monetary amount of money we need to be able to pull down in a year. And it's not just on a, you know what I'm saying? So I'm hoping that maybe that down the road, helps make the world a little brighter for somebody else that wants to choose this. I don't think it makes you sound greedy. I, I know for me, it made me sound ungrateful. And so I've never until now expressed that or told anybody, you know, what we just discussed because I didn't yeah. want to, I didn't want to be the diva of the sport. So I would just kindly say no, or kindly say I was busy doing something else. But the reality yeah. is, is that it just, I couldn't survive off of that. I'd rather be doing other things no. or making money elsewhere. No. Yeah. No, I don't blame you. And it's like, that's just a reality. And it's like a lot of the other ones, like Gary had, had the college, you know, job all his life, tenured college professor. So, I mean, he loves doing that all day. I mean, that all day class we run together. It's like, and it's great. Cause it's great for me. Cause he's brought a lot of process to my, cause I'm more haphazard kind of the way I like to roll, like in a big group. I mean, but he's very, very organized from all the delivery sermons of being a college professor. Okay. So there's trade-offs. Like he learns a lot. I mean, it's both ways. Like I learned more about delivering the process, doing those with him. And it's just been, it's been a fun, fun thing. But, but yeah, he would have, he told me that many times. He can't believe that somebody could do this and this alone for a living and, and, and do it, but you can, it's just not an easy road though. So I'll, I'll say that <laughs> you got to do a lot of things, have a lot of irons and a lot of fires. Plus, not sell yourself out cheap to go somewhere. Does that make sense? So I just told, this is funny. I, well, I better not say this. Well, I'll tell you. So in California, we get done at the Pleasanton show and I was leaving. This guy comes up He goes, man, I really like that talk on wet fly. I'm like, great. He goes, would you come back out to talk to my club of four of us? I'm like, no, you can't afford me. Then he goes, let me tell you who's in my club. And they were all Hollywood people that have private waters, four of them. And he sent me this email. I'm going back out there in a few weeks, but I wouldn't have thought four people would have flown somebody back out there from here. Right. That's just not realistic. So you never know, man, the gift horse. Sometimes you look at them in the mouth and you realize, Oh, I about stuck my foot <laughs> right where I shouldn't have. You follow me? Cause I was tired. You get run down at those things. And when he said, we want you to come back. Yeah, I'll do it. But um, you meet you meet a lot of really great people on the road. You really do. There's a lot of really good people that you can tell them instantly. Yeah. And uh, I think that's the win. That's the win win of the sport, you know? Like, yep. I think that you got to come fish North Carolina one day when y'all come back to America. Well, I was in North Carolina in January. 
I did yeah. not know that I didn't even think to look you up. And I will absolutely do that when I come back. Cause I'm coming back, I think probably next April. I want to go turkey hunting. Oh yeah. And do yeah, some that fishing. Turkey hunting's big. There's a lot of turkey hunting right here. Yeah. 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 But, that's but what I, all my guides do come, come April, like several of them that are, yeah, they love, they love doing that. I'm due for some advanced lessons. There's some things that I want to pick your brain on, like really properly pick your brain on. So count me in. I'll be All there. Right. All right. I don't think it's so much about tall or short though, doing it, but it is as far as like mm, how high the D loop is above the water. Yeah. I, I adjust. There is like a, a preference when I go out playing with long belly where I like yeah. a certain length. I like to stand close to a certain height and I'll get all messed up. If I get in too deep or too shallow, it just messes everything up. So I think that's that way for everybody. Now, but I want to pick your brain about some single hand stuff. There's some distance stuff I've been working on. So I'll, I'll all right. Well, that you. sounds great. Well, I enjoyed, I enjoyed it, April. You have Likewise. a super night. Is there anything yeah. that you would like to add or to ask me before we hang up for tonight? No, I don't think. I'll think of something and I'll email you. Okay. But I, right now I don't have anything. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, and, I can't think of anything right now. Well, thank you for uh, for sharing all that. I, I do strongly encourage anyone listening to watch this on YouTube because then you'll, they'll be able to put a visual together with our with our hands. Yeah. And, no, that'd um, be great. Please stay in touch. Let me know if you come through Australia or BC and I will let you know when I come back through North Carolina. All right. Well, thanks. And, and I appreciate you taking the time. Likewise. I've enjoyed it. Likewise. Yeah. Thanks, Mac. I'll talk to you soon. All right. You too. Take care. Bye.